A View from a Hill by M. R. James, abridged and read by Stephen Tomlin. How pleasant it can be, alone in a first-class railway carriage, on the first day of a holiday, to dawdle through a bit of English country that is unfamiliar, stopping at every station. You have a map open on your knee, and you pick out the villages that lie to right and left by their church towers. You marvel at the complete stillness that attends your stoppage at the stations, broken only by a footstep crunching the gravel. The traveller I have in mind was making his leisurely progress on a sunny afternoon in the latter half of June. He was in the depths of the West Country, a man of academic pursuits. His term was just over, and he was on his way to meet a new friend, older than himself. The two of them had met first on an official inquiry in town, had found that they had many tastes and habits in common, liked each other, and the result was an invitation from Squire Richards to Mr Fanshawe, which was now taking effect. The journey ended about five o'clock. Fanshawe was told by a cheerful country porter that the car from the hall had been delayed. But I see, as you've got your bicycle, and very like you'll find it pleasanter to ride up to the hall yourself. Straight up the road here, and then first turn to the left. It ain't above two mile, and I'll see as your things is put in the car when it comes. The two miles to the hall were just what was needed, after the day in the train, to dispel somnolence and impart a wish for tea. The hall, when sighted, also promised just what was needed in the way of a quiet resting place after days of sitting on committees and college meetings. It was neither excitingly old nor depressingly new. Plastered walls, sash windows, old trees, smooth lawns were the features which Fanshawe noticed as he came up the drive. Squire Richards, a burly man of sixty-odd, was awaiting him in the porch with evident pleasure. Tea first, he said. Or would you like a longer drink? No? All right. Tea's ready in the garden. Well, come along. They'll put your machine away. I always have tea under the lime tree by the stream on a day like this. Nor could you ask for a better place. Midsummer afternoon. Shade and scent of a vast lime tree. Cool, swirling waters within five yards. It was long before either of them suggested a move. But about six, Mr. Richards sat up, knocked out his pipe and said, Look here, it's cool enough now to think of a stroll, if you're inclined. All right? Then what I suggest is that we walk up the park and get onto the hillside where we can look over the country. We'll have a map and I'll show you where things are. If you're ready, we can start now and be back well before eight and taking it very easy. I'm ready. I should like my stick, though, and uh, have you got any field glasses? I lent mine to a man a week ago, and he's gone off Lord knows where and taken them with him. Mr. Richards pondered. Yes, he said, I have, but they're not things I use myself, and I don't know whether the ones I have will suit you. They're old-fashioned and about twice as heavy as they make them now. Oh, you're welcome to have them. But I won't carry them. Uh, by the way, what do you want to drink after dinner? Protestations that anything would do were overruled, and a satisfactory settlement was reached on the way to the front hall, where Mr. Fanshawe found his stick, and Mr. Richards, after thoughtful pinching of his lower lip, resorted to a drawer in the hall table, extracted a key, across to a cupboard in the panelling, opened it, took a box from the shelf, and put it on the table. The glasses are in there, he said, and there's some dodge of opening it, but I've forgotten what it is. Well, you try. Mr. Fanshawe accordingly tried. There was no keyhole, and the box was solid, heavy, and smooth. It seemed obvious that some part of it would have to be pressed before anything could happen. The corners, said he to himself, are the likely places. Ow! And infernally sharp corners they are too, he added, as he put his thumb in his mouth after exerting force on the lower corner. What's the matter? said the squire. Why, your disgusting bordure box has scratched me, drat it, said Fanshawe. 
The squire chuckled unfeelingly. Well, you've got it open anyway, he said. So I have. Well, I don't begrudge a drop of blood in a good cause, and here are the glasses. They're pretty heavy, as you said, but I think I'm equal to carrying them. Ready? said the squire. Come on, then. We go out by the garden. So they did, and passed out into the park, which sloped decidedly upwards to the hill which dominated the country. It was a spur of a larger range that lay behind. On the way, the squire, who was great on earthworks, pointed out various spots where he detected, or imagined, traces of war ditches and the like. And here, he said, stopping on a more or less level plot with a ring of large trees, is Baxter's Roman villa. Baxter, said Mr. Fanshaw. Oh, I forgot. You don't know about him. He was the old chap I got those glasses from. I believe he made them. He was an old watchmaker down in the village, a great antiquary. My father gave him leave to grub about where he liked, and when he made a find, he used to lend him a man or two to help him with the digging. He got a surprising lot of things together. And when he died, I dare say it's about ten or fifteen years ago, I bought the whole lot and gave them to the town museum. The glasses came to me with the rest, but of course I kept them. Now, if you look at them, you'll see they're more or less amateur work, the body of them. Naturally, the lenses weren't his making. Yes, I see. They're just the sort of thing that a clever workman in a different line of business might turn out. But I don't see why he made them so heavy. And did Baxter actually find a Roman villa here? Oh, yes. It's a pavement turfed over where we're standing. It's too rough and plain to be worth taking up, but of course there are drawings of it, and the small things and pottery that turned up were quite good of their kind. An ingenious chap, old Baxter, he seemed to have a quite out-of-the-way instinct for these things. He was invaluable to our archaeologists. He used to shut up his shop for days at a time and wander off all over the district, marking down places where he scented anything on the ordnance map, and he kept a book with fuller notes of the places. Since his death, a good many of them have been sampled, and there's always been something to justify him. Oh, what a good man, said Mr. Fanshaw. Good, said the squire, pulling up brusquely. I meant useful to have about the place, said Mr. Fanshaw. But he was a villain? Oh, I don't know about that either, said the squire. But all I can say is, if he was good, he wasn't lucky. And he wasn't liked. I didn't like him, he added, after a moment. Oh, said Pancho. No, I didn't. But that's enough about Baxter. Besides, this is the stiffest bit, and I don't want to talk and walk as well. Indeed, it was hot, climbing a slippery grass slope that evening. <sighs> I told you I should take the short way, panted the squire, and I wish I hadn't. However... A bath won't do us any harm when we get back. Ah, here we are. Ah, and there's the seat. A small clump of old Scotch firs crowned the top of the hill, and, at the edge of it, commanding the cream of the view, was a wide and solid seat, on which the two disposed themselves, and wiped their brows, and regained breath. Now then, said the squire, as soon as he was in a condition to talk connectedly. This is where your glasses come in. But you'd better take a general look round first. My word, I've never seen the view look better. Across a broad, level plain, they looked upon ranges of great hills, whose uplands, some green, some furred with woods, caught the light of a sun, westering, but not yet low. And all the plain was fertile though the river which traversed it was nowhere seen. There were copses, green wheat, hedges and pasture land. The little compact white moving cloud marked the evening train. Then the eye picked out red farms and grey houses, and nearer home scattered cottages, and then the hall, nestled under the hill. The smoke of chimneys was very blue and straight. There was a smell of hay in the air. There were wild roses on bushes hard by. It was the acme of summer. 
After some minutes of silent contemplation, the squire began to point out the leading features, the hills and valleys, and told where the towns and villages lay. Now, he said, with the glasses you'll be able to pick out Fulnica Abbey. Take a line across that big green field, over the wood beyond it, then over the farm, on the knoll. Yes, yes, said Franchot, I've got it. What a fine tower. We must have got the wrong direction, said the squire. There's not much of a tower about there that I remember, unless it's Oldbourne Church that you've got hold of. And if you call that a fine tower, you're easily pleased. Well, I do call it a fine tower, said Fanshawe, the glasses still at his eyes, whether it's Oldbourne or any other. And it must belong to a largest church. It looks to me like a central tower, four big pinnacles at the corners, and four smaller ones between. I must certainly go over there. How far is it? Oldbourne's about nine miles, or less, said the squire. It's a long time since I've been there, but I don't remember thinking much of it. Now, I'll show you another thing. Vanshaw had lowered the glasses, and was still gazing in the Oldbourne direction. No, he said. I can't make out anything with the naked eye. What was it you were going to show me? A good deal more to the left. It oughtn't to be difficult to find. Do you see a rather sudden knob of a hill with a thick wood on top of it? It's in a dead line with that single tree on the top of the big ridge. Ah, I do, said Pancho. I believe I could tell you without much difficulty what it's called. Well, could you now, said the squire. Oh, say on. Why, Gallows Hill, was the answer. How did you guess that? Well, if you don't want it guessed... You shouldn't put up a dummy gibbet and a man hanging on it. What's that? said the squire abruptly. There's nothing on that hill but wood. On the contrary, said Fanshawe. There's a largish expanse of grass on the top and your dummy gibbet in the middle. And I thought there was something on it when I looked first. But I see there's nothing. Or is there? I can't be sure. Nonsense, nonsense, Fanshawe. There's no such thing as a dummy gibbet or any other sort on that hill. And it's thick wood, a fairly young plantation. I was in it myself not a year ago. Hand me the glasses. Though I don't suppose I can see anything. After a pause. No, I thought not. They won't show a thing. Meanwhile, Fanshawe was scanning the hill. It might be only two or three miles away. Well, it's very odd, he said. It does look exactly like a wood, without the glass. He took it again. That is one of the oddest effects. The gibbet is perfectly plain, and the grass field. There even seem to be people on it. Carts, or a cart, with men in it. And yet when I take the glass away, there's nothing. There must be something in the way this afternoon light falls. I shall come up earlier in the day, when the sun's full on it. Did you say you saw people in a cart on that hill, said the squire incredulously. What should they be doing there at this time of day? Even if the trees have been felled. Oh, do talk sense. Look again. Well, I certainly thought I saw them. Yes, I should say there were a few, just clearing off. And now, by Jove, it does look like something hanging on the gibbet. But these glasses are so beastly heavy, I can't hold them steady for long. Anyhow, you can take it from me, there's no wood. And if you'll show me the road on the map, I'll go there tomorrow. The squire remained brooding for some little time. At last he rose and said, Well, I suppose that'll be the best way to settle it. And now we'd better be getting back. Bath and dinner is my idea. And on the way back, he was not very communicative. They returned through the garden and went into the front hall to leave sticks, etc., in their due place. And here they found the aged butler, Patton, evidently in a state of some anxiety. "'Beg pardon, Master Henry,' he began at once, "'but there's someone's been up to mischief here, I'm much afraid.' He pointed to the open box, which had contained the glasses. "'Nothing worse than that, Patton,' said the squire. "'Mayn't I take out my own glasses and lend them to a friend? "'I brought with my own money, you recollect.' But old Baxter's sale, eh? Patton bowed, unconvinced. Oh, very well, Master Henry. As long as you know who it was. 
Only I thought proper to name it, for I didn't think that box had been off its shelf since you first put it there. And, if you'll excuse me, after what happened... The voice was lowered, and the rest was not audible to Fanshawe. The squire replied with a few words and a gruff laugh, and called on Fanshawe to come and be shown to his room. A sensation invaded Fanshawe in the small hours, that something had been let out, which ought not to have been let out, and he consequently slept badly. He did not get up very early, nor did he at once plunge into the exploration of the country, but instead spent a morning, half lazy, half instructive, looking over the volumes of the County Archaeological Society's transactions. There were many contributions from Mr Baxter on finds of flint implements, Roman sites, ruins of monastic establishments, in fact, most departments of archaeology, all written in an odd, pompous, half-educated style. If the man had had more early schooling, thought Fanshawe, he would have been a very distinguished antiquary. Or he might have been, but for a certain love of opposition and controversy. And, yes, a patronising tone, as of one possessing superior knowledge, which left an unpleasant taste. He might have been a very respectable artist, too. There was an imaginary restoration and elevation of a priory church, which was very well conceived. A fine, pinnacled central tower was a conspicuous feature of this. It reminded Fanshawe of that which he had seen from the hill, and which the squire had told him must be Oldbourne. But it was not Oldbourne. It was Fulnicker Priory. Oh well, he said to himself. I suppose Oldbourne Church may have been built by Fulnicker monks, and Baxter has copied Oldbourne Tower. Ah, I see it was published after his death, found among his papers. After lunch, the squire asked Fanshawe what he meant to do. Well, said Fanshawe, I think I shall go out on my bike about four, as far as Oldbourne and back by Gallows Hill. That ought to be a round of about fifteen miles, oughtn't it? Uh, about that, said the squire, and you'll pass Lambsfield and Wanstone, both of which are worth looking at. There's a little glass at Lambsfield and the stone at Wanstone. Oh, good, said Fanshawe. I'll get tea somewhere. Oh, and uh, may I take the glasses? I'll strap them on my bike on the carrier. Of course, if you like, said the squire. I really ought to have some better ones. Uh, if I go into town today, I'll see if I can pick up some. Old Patton doesn't think these are fit to use. Is he a judge? Oh, he's got some tale. I don't know. Something about old Baxter. I promised to let him tell me about it. It seems very much on his mind since last night. He was looking at an old man this morning, and he said he hadn't closed an eye. Well, let him save up his tale till I come back. Very well, I will if I can. Now, look here. Are you going to be late? If you get a puncture eight miles off and have to walk home, what then? I don't trust these bicycles. I shall tell them to give us cold things to eat. Well, I shan't mind that, whether I'm late or early. But I've got things to mend punctures with. And now, I'm off. It was just as well that the squire had made that arrangement about a cold supper, Fanshawe thought, and not for the first time, as he wheeled his bicycle up the drive about nine o'clock. So also the squire thought, and said several times, as he met him in the hall, rather pleased at the confirmation of his want of faith in bicycles than sympathetic with his hot, weary, thirsty, and indeed haggard friend. In fact, the kindest thing he found to say was, "'You'll want a long drink tonight. A cider cup do. All right. Hear that, Patton? A cider cup, iced, lots of it.' Then to Fanshawe, "'Don't be all night over your bath.' By half-past nine they were at dinner, and Fanshawe was reporting progress, if progress it might be called. I got to Lambsfield very smoothly and saw the glass. It's very interesting stuff, but there's a lot of lettering I couldn't read. Not with glasses, said the squire. Well, those glasses of yours are no manner of use inside a church, or inside anywhere, I suppose, for that matter. But the only places I took them into were churches. Hmm. Well, go on, said the squire. However, I took some sort of a photograph of the window, and I dare say an enlargement would show what I want. 
Then, one stand. Has anybody opened the mound it stands on? Uh, Baxter wanted to, but the farmer wouldn't let him. Oh, well, I should think it would be worth doing. Anyhow, the next thing was a fornica and Oldbourne. You know, it's very odd about that tower I saw from the hill. Oldbourne Church is nothing like it. And, of course, there's nothing over thirty feet high at Folnica, uh, though you can see it did have a central tower. I didn't tell you, did I, that Baxter's fancy drawing of Folnica shows a tower exactly like the one I saw. Uh, so you thought, I dare say, put in the squire. No, it wasn't a case of thinking. The picture actually reminded me of what I'd seen, and I made sure it was Oldbourne well before I looked at the title. Well, Baxter had a fair idea of architecture. I dare say what's left made it easy for him to draw the right sort of tower. Well, that may be it, of course, but I'm doubtful if even a professional could have got it so exactly right. There's absolutely nothing left at Tolnica but the bases of the piers which supported it. However, that isn't the oddest thing. What about Gallows Hill? said the squire. Here, Patton, listen to this. Told you what Mr. Fanshawe said he saw from the hill. Yes, Master Henry, you did. And I can't say I was much surprised, considering... All right, all right. We'll keep that till afterwards. We want to hear what Mr. Fanshawe saw today. Well, go on, Fanshawe. I got to the turning which goes to the top of Gallows Hill. I saw that if I wheeled my machine over the field at the top of the hill, I could join the home road on this side. It was about half past six when I got to the top of the hill and there was a gate on my right, leading into the belt of plantation. You hear that, Patton? A belt, he says. Well, so I thought it was. A belt. But it wasn't. You were quite right, and I was hopelessly wrong. I cannot understand it. The whole top is planted quite thick. Well, I went on into this wood, wheeling and dragging my bike, expecting every minute to come to a clearing, and then my misfortunes began. A thorns, I suppose. At first I realised that the front tyre was slack, then the back. I couldn't stop to do more than to try to find the punctures and mark them, but even that was hopeless. So I ploughed on, and the farther I went, the less I liked the place. Not much poaching in that cover, eh, Patton? said the squire. No, indeed, Master Henry. There's very few who cares to go in... No, I know, I know. I just never mind that now. I'll go on, Fanshawe. I don't blame anybody for not caring to go there. I know I had all the fancies one least likes. The steps crackling over twigs behind me. Indistinct people stepping behind trees in front of me. And yes, and even a hand laid on my shoulder. I pulled up very sharp at that and looked round. But there really was no branch or bush that could have done it. Then, when I was just about at the middle of the plot, I was convinced that there was someone looking down on me from above and not with any pleasant intent. I stopped again, or at least slackened my pace to look up, and as I did, down I came, and barked my shins abominably on, what do you think? A block of stone, with a big square hole in the top of it. And within a few paces, there were two others just like it. The three were set in a triangle. Now, do you make out what they were put there for? I think I can, said the squire was now very grave and absorbed in the story. Sit down, Patton. It was time, for the old man was supporting himself by one hand and leaning heavily on it. He dropped into a chair and said, You didn't go between them stones, did you, sir? No, I did not, said Fanshawe emphatically. I dare say I was an ass, but as soon as it dawned on me where I was, I just shouldered my machine and did my best to run. It seemed to me as if I was in an unholy evil sort of graveyard, and I was most profoundly thankful that it was one of the longest days and still sunlight. Well, I had a horrid run, even if it was only a few hundred yards. Everything caught on everything. Handles and spokes and carriers and pedals caught in them viciously. I fancied so. I fell over at least five times. At last, I saw the hedge, and I couldn't trouble to hunt for the gate dropped the machine over somehow and went into the road pretty near head first. Some branch or something got my ankle at the last moment. Anyhow, there I was, out of the wood, and seldom more thankful or more generally sore. 
Then came the job of mending my punctures. I had a good outfit, and I'm not at all bad at the business, but this was an absolute hopeless case. It was seven when I got out of the wood, and I spent fifty minutes over one tyre. As fast as I found a hole and put on a patch and blew it up again, it went flat. So I made up my mind to walk. Well, that's my story. Where's yours? And patterns? Mine? Oh, I've no story, said the squire. But you weren't very far out when you thought you were in the graveyard. There must be a good few of them up there, Patton, don't you think? They left them there when they fell to bits, I fancy. Now then, Patton, you've heard what sort of a time Mr. Fanshawe's been having. What do you make of it? Anything to do with Mr. Baxter? Fill yourself a glass of port and tell us. Ah, hmm. Ah. Well, that done me good, Master Henry, said Patton, after absorbing what was before him. If you really wish to know what were in my thoughts, my answer will be clear in the affirmative. Yes, he went on, warming to his work. I would say as Mr. Fanshawe's experience of today were very largely due to the person you named. And I think, Master Henry, as I have some title to speak, in view of me being many years on speaking terms with him, and swore in to be jury foreman on the coroner's inquest near this time ten years ago. Inquest, said Fanshawe. An inquest on Mr. Baxter, was there? Yes, sir. On that very person. The facts as led up to that occurrence was these. The deceased was, as you may have gathered, a very peculiar individual in his habits. He lived very much to himself, without neither chick nor child, as the saying is. We know how intent he was in rummaging and ransacking out all the history of the neighbourhood and the number of things he'd managed to collect together. They were spoke of for miles round as Baxter's Museum. Many a time when he might be in the mood, and I might have an hour to spare, have he showed me his pieces of pots and what not, going back to the times of the Romans. But, however interesting... There was something about the man. Well, for one thing, no one ever remembered to see him in church or chapel at service time, and that made talk. Then how did he spend his nights, particularly about this season of the year? Time and again, the labouring men had meet him coming back as they went out to their work, and he'd pass them by without a word, looking, they says, like someone straight out of the asylum. They see the whites of his eyes all round. He'd have a fish basket with him, that they noticed, and he always come the same road. And the talk got to be that he'd made himself some business, and that not the best kind. Not so far from where you was at seven o'clock this evening, sir. Well, now, after such a night as that, Mr. Baxter, he'd shut up the shop, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, there come a most fearful to-do inside, and smoke out of the windows, and Baxter crying out, seemingly even in agony. So George Williams, as lived next door, he run round to the back premises and burst the door in, and several others come too. Well, he tell me he never in all his life smelt such a fearful odour as that what there was in that kitchen place. It seems as if Baxter had been boiling something in a pot and overset it on his leg. There he was, laid on the floor, trying to keep back the cries. But it was more than he could manage. And when the people come in, he was in a nice condition. Well, they picked him up, got him in a chair, and run for the medical man. And one of them was going to pick up the pot. And Baxter, he screams out to let it alone. So he did. But the neighbour couldn't see as there was anything in the pot but a few old brown bones. Then they says... Dr. Lawrence will be here in a minute, Mr. Baxter. He'll soon put you to rights. And then he was off again. He must be up to his room. He couldn't have the doctor come in there and see all that mess. They must throw a cloth over it. Anything. The tablecloth out of the parlour. Well, so they did. But that must have been poisonous stuff in that pot. For it was pretty near on two months before Baxter were about again. Beg pardon, Master Henry, was you going to say something? I was going to say I remember old Lawrence telling me he'd attended Baxter. 
He was a queer card, he said. Lawrence was up in the bedroom one day and picked up a little mask covered with black velvet and put it on in fun and went to look at himself in the glass. He hadn't time for a proper look, for old Baxter shouted out to him from the bed, Put it down, you fool! Do you want to look through a dead man's eyes? And it startled him so that he did put it down. And then he asked Baxter what he meant. And Baxter insisted on him handing it over and said the man he bought it from was dead or some such nonsense. But Lawrence felt it as he handed it over and he declared he was sure it was made out of the front of a skull. But go on, Pat. Yes, Master Henry. Oh, I'm nearly done now. And time too, for I don't know what they'll think about me in the servants' hall. Well, this business of the scalding was some years before Mr. Baxter was took, and he got about again and went on just as he used to. And one of the last jobs he'd done was finishing up them actual glasses what you took out last night. You see, he'd made the body of them some long time ago, and he got the pieces of glass for them, but there was something wanted to finish them, or whatever it was, I don't know. But I picked up the frame one day, and I says, Mr. Baxter, why don't you make a job of this? And he says, Ah, when I done that, you'll hear news, you will. There's going to be no such pair of glasses as mine when they're filled and sealed. And there he stopped. And I says, Why, Mr. Baxter, you talk as if they was wine bottles. Filled and sealed? Why? Where's the necessity for that? Did I say filled and sealed? He says. Oh, well, I was suiting my conversation to my company. Well, then comes round this time of year. And one fine evening, I was passing his shop and he was standing on the step, very pleased with himself, and he says, All right and tight now. My best bit of work's finished and I'll be out with him tomorrow. What? Finish them glasses, I says. Might I have a look at them? No, no, he says. I put them to bed for tonight, and when I do show them you, you'll have to pay for peeping, so I tell you. And that, gentlemen, were the last words I heard that man say. That was the 17th of June, and just a week after, there was a funny thing happened, and it was due to that as we brought in On Sound Mine at the inquest. George Williams has lived in the next house, you remember. He woke up that same night with a stumbling and tumbling about in Mr. Baxter's premises. And he got out of bed and he went to the front window on the street to see if there was any rough customers about. And it being a very light night, he could make sure as there was not. Then he stood and listened. And he heard Mr. Baxter coming down his front stair one step after another, very slow. And he got the idea as if it was like someone being pushed or pulled down and holding on to everything he could. Next thing, he hear the street door come open and out come Mr. Baxter in his day clothes, hat and all, with his arms straight down by his sides and talking to himself and shaking his head from one side to the other and walking in that peculiar way that he appeared to be going as if it were against his own will. George Williams put up the window and hear him say, Oh, mercy, gentlemen. And then he shut up sudden as if, he said, someone clapped his hand over his mouth. And Mr. Baxter threw his head back and his hat fell off. And Williams sees his face looking something pitiful, so as he couldn't help calling out to him, Why, Mr. Baxter, they knew well. And he was going to offer to fetch Dr. Lawrence to him. Only he heard the answer. "'Tis best you mind your own business. Put in your head." But whether it were Mr. Baxter said it, he never could be sure. Still, there weren't no one but him in the street, and yet Williams was that upset by the way he spoke that he shrank back from the window and went and sat on the bed. And he heard Mr. Baxter's step go on and up the road. And after a minute or more, he couldn't help but look out once more, and he see him going along the same curious way as before. And one thing he recollected was that Mr. Baxter never stopped to pick up his hat when it fell off. And yet, there it was, on his head. Well, Master Henry, that was the last anybody see of Mr. Baxter. Leastways for a week or more. 
There was a lot of people said he was caught off on business or made off because he'd got into some scrape. But he was well known for miles round. And none of the railway people nor the public house people hadn't seen him. And when ponds was looked into and nothing found. And at last, one evening, Fakes the keeper come down from over the hill to the village. And he says he'd seen the gallows hill planted black with birds. And that was a funny thing. Because he'd never seen no sign of a creature there in his time. So they looked at each other a bit. And half a dozen of them set out in the evening time and took Dr. Lawrence with them. And you know, Master Henry, there he was, between them three stones, with his neck broke. Useless to imagine the talk which this story set going. But before Patton left them, he said to Fanshawe, Excuse me, sir, but did I understand as you took out them glasses with you today? I thought you did. And might I ask, did you make use of them at all? Uh, yes, uh, only to look at something in a church. Oh, indeed. You took them into the church, did you, sir? Uh, yes, I did. Oh, by the way, I, I've left them strapped onto my bicycle, I'm afraid, uh, in the stable yard. No matter for that, sir. I can bring them in first thing tomorrow, and perhaps you'll be so good as to look at them then? Accordingly, before breakfast, after a tranquil and well-earned sleep, Fanshawe took the glasses into the garden and directed them to a distant hill. He lowered them instantly, and looked at top and bottom, worked the screws, and tried them again and yet again, shrugged his shoulders, and replaced them on the hall table. Patton, he said, they're absolutely useless. I can't see a thing. It's as if someone had stuck a black wafer over the lens. Spoiled my glasses, have you? said the squire. Oh, thank you. They're the only ones I've got. Well, you try them yourself, said Fanshawe. I've done nothing to them. So, after breakfast, the squire took them out to the terrace and stood on the steps. After a few ineffectual attempts, Lord, how heavy they are, he said, and in the same instant dropped them onto the stones, and the lens splintered and the barrel cracked. A little pool of liquid formed on the stone slab. It was inky black, and the odour that rose from it is not to be described. Filled and sealed, eh? said the squire. If I could bring myself to touch it, I dare say we should find a seal. So that's what's come of his boiling and distilling, is it? The old ghoul. What in the world do you mean? Oh, well, don't you see? Remember what he said to the doctor about looking through dead men's eyes? Well, this was another way of it. But they didn't like having their bones boiled, I take it. And the end of it was, they carried him off whether he would not. Well, I'll get a spade, and we'll bury this thing decently. As they smoothed the turf over it, the squire, handing the spade to Patton, who had been a reverential spectator, remarked to Fanshawe, "'It's almost a pity you took those glasses into the church, sir. You might have seen more than you did. Backstrad them for a week, I make out. But I don't see that he did much in the time.' "'I'm not sure,' said Fanshawe. "'There is that picture of Falnica Priory Church.' Thank you.